What's up everybody, Matthew here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Hey, a while ago, I came up with this crazy idea that I should limit the books that I'm reading for the rest of my life to just 100 books. Now, I know that sounds absolutely crazy because there are so many good books to read. In fact, there's new books all the time. There's new books coming out today. There's new books coming out tomorrow and next week. There's so many books to read. And not only that, not only the new ones, but there's so many old ones as well. Old ones that are worthy of your earnest consideration. Well, my idea was simply this, that look, you're going to die and I'm going to die. And probably sooner than we wish. Our lives are very short. We're mortal. We're finite. We're made out of dust. Our lives are very, very temporary. And so what you should do, even if you live 100 years or 80 years or only 50 years or whatever, is wouldn't it make sense for you to confine your reading list down to the most important books that have ever been written in the whole of history? That way, you would be narrowing your scope of learning to the things that really, really, really are significant. Because again, if your life is brief and beautiful and short and wonderful, but very, very mortal and finite, why not read the best things that you could possibly get your hands on in the short time that you're alive? So that's my theory, right? So I talked about that theoretically a while back. And then what I actually did was I began to literally come up with a hundred books that I would probably read if my life was going to focus on only those best. Now, I will tell you this, and I'm going to be completely honest. I'm not sure that I myself am going to commit to the very thing that I'm recommending to you today. But I do have some good news for you. I have narrowed it down to the top 100 books that I would read if I were going to go forward with this program. If you are new to this channel, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, please, by all means, come check us out. So here's what I've done. I've, I've done something for you. On my YouTube channel, I have already posted a sheet, a Google sheet that has my top 100 books in alphabetical order. So you're not going to know what the top books are until we get through all of the list. But nevertheless, I just want to show you this if I can. So let me flip over here to my YouTube channel. Okay, now you know where this is because you're watching me on YouTube right now. If you go back to the main YouTube page here for my channel, Matthew Everhard, Click on this spot. You see my mouse moving around. It's right here on this more links thing. And if you drop that down, just scroll through the boring stuff about me, ignore all that. And if you flip down here, there is a click where you can hit it and it'll bring up a sheet of a hundred very, very, very excellent books that I'm going to be recommending in this particular series that I'm going to do right now. So I thought it'd be fun. If we would start with number 100 today and just see how far we can go, maybe we'll do the top 25, let's say. You think we can do that together? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the book and the title and its rank and its order. We're going to start with 100. We're going to work all the way to number one in subsequent videos, of course. Today, we're just going to do the top bottom 25, 100 through 76 or whatever that is. And then I'll make subsequent videos and I'll continue to go until we get to number one. And you can see what I think is the best book of all time. Okay, now I am excluding the Bible because the Bible is so far and away the best book. It's the divinely inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. So we all understand that for those of us who are Christians. Let's set that aside and let's talk about the best 100 books that you should probably spend the rest of your life reading. Some of them you're going to agree with, some of them you're not. Let's start with number 100. Number 100 on my list, Tales of the Greek Heroes by Roger Lancel and Green. Immediately you say, I thought this was a Christian list. Trust me, it is a Christian list. But I do have some non-Christian books on here. I have some poetry. I've got some stuff that uh, is for kids, <laughs> believe it or not, that I find to be rich and edifying. And this is one of those books. This is one of those books that gives you in brief enjoyable format, some of the stories of the Greek and the Roman heroes of old. So that's my number 100. Number 99 is a book that selfishly I did contribute to this one. I have a couple of short little articles here. The Jonathan Edwards Encyclopedia. Of course, I'm an Edwards scholar. Of course, I'm going to have some Jonathan Edwards on this list, but probably not as much Edwards as you might think. Okay, but this one is a great one if you just want to learn a little bit of the background of Jonathan Edwards. Number 98, another kid's book. I promise I'm not going to do this all day, but there are a couple of them on this list. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Wonderful, wonderful compilation of some of the legends of King Arthur. 
By the way, there's a lot of Christian themes that work through books like this, especially as you see kind of that framework of Christianity underscoring what it means to be a brave and courageous man. You definitely see that in the life of King Arthur. Number 97, here's a biography for you. I've got all kinds of genres on this list. Number 97 is a biography of Charles Spurgeon by Arnold Dalimore. I did think this book was a little bit overly hagiographic, which is a word that means too positive on his life. I think the only fault that Dalimore finds with Spurgeon is that he smokes cigars, which some of us reform people say, hey, may not be a fault after all, might be a strength. Anyway, great biography. If you're looking for an overview of Spurgeon's life, this is the one. Number 96, The Early Christians in Their Own Words by Eberhard Arnold. No relation to me. I'm Everhard. He's Eberhard. That's a story in itself, but I could go on. This is a great little book just to read some of the earliest Christians. You're going to get a little bit of Justin Martyr. You're going to get a little bit of Irenaeus. You're going to get a little bit of Polycarp if you're interested, but you don't necessarily want to read tomes. This is a great book just to give you a snippet of what the early church was like. Number 95, just read this one. Just recently read this one, The Secrets of an Unlikely Convert by Rosaria Champagne Butterfield. Great book. I'm going to use this in my upcoming evangelism class at RPTS because the people that led her to the Lord by God's sovereign providence, of course, God is the one who converts, man, they did it all the right way as far as loving a sinner and embracing her into their home and sharing the gospel with her and loving her through times of turmoil in her life. Great, great story of a lesbian English professor at a major university who converts and actually becomes an RPCNA reform Presbyterian. Love the story. Awesome, awesome book. Number 94. Here's one by another woman. Showings by Julian of Norwich. Interesting. Don't have much to say in terms of agreement with her. She's very expressionistic, very pietistic, very mystical, very visionary in her understanding of her relationship with Christ, but nevertheless, there are some things, I think, in this book that do edify the soul. Number 93, here's another good story that everybody should just read, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. A lot of Reformed theology actually finds its way into this book. You might be surprised to see some of the themes of providence and God's sovereignty over all events in this particular book. Number 92, here's one that I read to my daughter Simone, and she loved it, Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. A strange and bizarre tale, no doubt about that, but certainly one that you should probably read at some point in your life. Number 91, let's stick to that theme here, Tom Sawyer. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Got to love this book. There's a scene where he's trying to endure a church service. I think it's pretty close to the beginning of the book. It is so absolutely hilarious. This book is laugh out loud fun. Not only is it a great American novel, but it is richly entertaining and you'll find yourself delighted by the wiles of Tom Sawyer all throughout the book. Number 90, True Spirituality by Francis Schaeffer. I've got a few Francis Schaeffer books in this particular list. I think even another one to go in this particular set of books that we're going to talk about. True Spirituality is Francis Schaeffer's call to sincere humility, discipleship, faith, and Love. It's a great book. You're going to love that one. Number 89. Here's another one that I read to my daughters. You're probably noticing that I'm kind of backloading um, some of these things to more enjoyable general books. That's probably true in this part of the list. You're definitely going to get a lot of systematic and reformed theology as we go through this list. So if you're wondering why I'm so heavy on some of this fictional stuff, it's on the list, but it's not necessarily going to be in my top 20. This is a great one. I love reading this one out loud to my girls. They loved it too back when we were doing this book. I love to do all the voices. It's just good daddy-daughter time if you happen to have daughters. 88, here's one. Ah, oh, this is awesome. I cannot believe this is ranked so low. It's 88 on a list of 100. But The Valley of the Vision, awesome, awesome prayers. If you're looking for something to help you in your devotional life, if you're looking for things to read at the dinner table... If the responsibility falls on you next Thanksgiving to say the prayer before the meal, you can do no wrong but to turn to this particular book right here and read one of these prayers. You can meditate it on it for a half an hour, or you could simply read it out loud and your soul will be richly blessed. The Valley of Vision. Gotta love that one. 87. Through the Gates of Splendor by Elizabeth Elliot. Love this book because the life of Jim Elliot, who was a martyr, 
is, is one of the books that really, really inspired me and still does inspire me in terms of calling to global missions. Elliot, of course, was speared to death by the Wyodani Indians in Ecuador, South America. And his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, went back and continued on the work of the Lord, even though her husband had just been killed. And she went and by God's grace, many persons in that tribe were converted to Jesus Christ. It's an incredible story, one of the greatest stories of Christian history, and it's number 87 on my list. 86, A Simple Way to Pray by Martin Luther. Luther had a conversation with his barber, that's right, about how to pray. His barber wanted to know how a Christian should pray, and so what Luther did, I think it's fantastic, he wrote out the simple, simple little tract about how a Christian should pray Normally, uh, he says you should pray through the Lord's Prayer and with the Apostles' Creed in mind and just simple, faithful utterances from the heart to the Lord. Great little book on prayer. Number 85, The Sovereignty of God by A.W. Pink. It's been a good 15 plus years since I've read this one. But if you're looking for an overall summary of God's absolute control and, and sovereignty, his providence over all things, all nations, all history, from the largest events of world history to the, to the smallest little events of your life, A.W. Pink has you covered in this very biblical, richly theological work on the sovereignty of God. Number 84, here's another fictional work for you, but one that I think you're going to find some very interesting theological themes Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Again, I apologize if you're not into fiction. Some of you are not. And this top 25 or bottom 25, I guess, as it is, does have a lot of fiction in it. But this is a good one. This is a good one. I'm only giving you the best of the best. And this is one that you're just going to see perhaps even elements of your own soul in the way that Jekyll and Hyde interrelate with one another. And one of them must die. All right. 80. Wait a second. Did I do this wrong? 84? No. Okay, we're on to it. 83. Luther's small catechism. Now, I'm not Lutheran. I used to be. I'm Reformed and I'm Presbyterian, uh, a PCA, right? But this is still a good, helpful book. Now, there's a couple of things that Luther says in here that I'm going to disagree with because I'm not Lutheran. But his catechism was significant because he brought the idea of catechetical discipleship to the Reformation churches, and we never let that go, especially the good reformers continued to write catechisms. You're probably thinking of Heidelberg and Westminster and some of the Baptist catechisms, but Luther was the one who paved the way, and we definitely should read, at least at some point, a small catechism. 82. Now, this isn't the title that I had on my book, okay? When I had the book, and I still have it, it's over there, the poems of Emily Dickinson. This was not the title, but the one that I have, I don't think is in print anymore. So I'm going to give you this one. By the way, don't forget, if you're looking for where to get these books, you can click on my list there. Remember, I showed it to you. It's on my YouTube channel. And I'm going to have links to all of these books. So you can just go grab the ones. I did a video on this at one point because this is way out of my strike zone. This is way out of my genre. This is out of my preferred field of literature. But every once in a while, it's very important that you jump over the fence and stray in the pasture and uh, mingle amongst the lilies of some kinds of literature that stretch you as a person. I found Emily Dickinson did that to me and therefore I enjoyed her poetry. Number 81, John Frame's Selected Shorter Writings. Now, Frame was my professor. Some of you love him, some of you don't. I find him very reedy, readable, reedy, readable, and very edifying. And so I've read most or a lot of his stuff in both theology and in philosophy. This is just a wonderful little collection of short little chapters, little essays, little articles on various themes, and I found them to be very delightful. Number 80, sticking with selected shorter writings. How about those of J. Gresham Machen? Now, for those of you who say J. Gresham Machen, I do it all the time. It's actually J. Gresham Machen, and he has a lot of really good books. Probably the best one is Christianity and Liberalism, which you're going to see later on this list. But this is a good one, too, his selected shorter writings. If you want something that you can read in about 15 minutes and then just be done with it, selected short writings are the way to go with that. Number 79. Reformed Dogmatics by Herman Bovig. Now, some of you are about to vomit in your mouth a little bit, 
but I don't have the five volumes. I only have the abridged one volume. And I, I know it. I can feel you throwing spit wads at me right now. But I've got the abridged version, and I do like it. It's not my favorite systematic theology. You're going to see several others ranked ahead of it, but I love it for what it is. Herman Bovink's Reform Dogmatics. Number 78, Collected Writings of John Murray. Now, I hope that this is still in print. Banner of Truth has done this one. I got mine at a book sale. In fact, I'm missing at least one volume, but the two that I have are absolutely gold. John Murray, one of those great professors from yesteryear whose shadow is a mile long in terms of his influence. Wish we still had churchmen like John Murray today, but if you can find an edition of, of his collected works, it's definitely going to be worth the price. Whatever you can pay for them, find them on eBay or buy them new if they still put them out. Number 77, Brave New World. Now, this book has some sexually explicit themes in it, so I do want to issue a little warning here. For some of you, I had some parents ask me if I thought it was appropriate for their teenager. My counsel to them was, maybe it is. You know your teen probably better than me and some of the proclivities and temptations that may be there. But this is really interesting because if you like dystopias, and I, I think you probably should, there's reasons why you should like dystopias because they're warnings about what happens with governmental power out of control. Brave New World is one of those uh, very interesting kind of unfortunate, perhaps, glimpses into our future as a Western society. Finally, we'll stop here today. Number 76, the complete works of Aristotle Got to get some philosophy on that list, and Aristotle certainly deserves a place in that field. You'll see other philosophical works as we move through this list. Okay, so that's it for today. We're going to come back to the top 100 list on another video or two or three or four, however long it takes us to get to the top number one. And as we do that, we'll maybe slow down and talk about some of these books a little bit more in depth, but I wanted to kind of cruise through this bottom 25 real fast like hope you enjoyed this video thank you so much for checking in don't forget that they're all found on my youtube channel uh, just find the link it'll be there trust me all right i love you guys thanks for checking in talk to you later